Morning. Thanks, George. Um, great to be here. Nice to see a lot of uh, friendly faces. So I'm, I'm going to, we, we actually just started looking uh, at the Exxon Array. And for any of you that know me, you know that I, I like looking at new technologies and see how we can apply it, um, you know, for advancing diagnostics uh, for our patients. So uh, just a thermo disclaimer. So it's, it's speaking to the choir over here, um, but probably if you step back, many of you don't realize that we've been looking at chromosomes for about 50 years. And one of the classical things that we know in terms of aneuploidy and prenatal diagnosis, and I'll thank Zeb for setting this talk up really nicely for me, is that there are distinct structural anomalies that often accompany them. So we know the classic heart defects in about 50% of Down syndrome, and that goes way uh, above 90% when we start looking at trisomies 18 and, and 13. But there are multiple anomalies that uh, often go together with the aneuploidies. And <clears throat> structural anomalies we know are found in about 2 to 5% of birth defects in the US. It's the leading cause of infant death, and uh, in most cases it can be routinely diagnosed in the second trimester. So I'm going to put this up, and often people ask, well, what's the likelihood of finding an abnormality when we do prenatal diagnosis? And it really amazes me that people look for, like, one figure. And uh, I took all our data at Columbia, and, uh, you know, overall, if you look at CVS and amnio, the greater majority of those are going to be normal, and that's because most of those are AMAs, um, and about 11% of them are abnormal. But that's really not a good figure because you should be structuring that question you know, differently. So if you say, how often do you see an abnormal carrier type? We see it in 29% of uh, prenatals, again, lumping CBS and amnio together. And now I'm choosing specifically when you see ultrasound abnormalities. And when you exclude ultrasound and ab abnormalities, it's about 4.9%. Again, lumping CBS and amnio together. So that question really uh, should be asked not only in terms of the time, but also in terms of the indication or the reason for referral. And when you break that down, you start to see very different figures. So uh, for those pregnancies that have anomalies at the time of CVS, it's almost 50-50 that we see an abnormality. That drops down to quite, um, you know, quite considerably when you look at the time of amniocentesis, so it's about 17%. And for all other indications, it's about 6% at the time of CVS, and again, about half of that for all other indications. And then again, I've, I've kind of put all those figures together. So what are the things that we see? And um, again, this should be quite familiar to most of you. Um, the ones I have highlighted are the reasons that we do rapid aneuploidy testing, the reasons that NIPT came about uh, targeting chromosomes 13, 18, and 21 and the sex chromosomes. You can see they're by far the, mo the more prevalent ones. And <clears throat> we have been used to uh, doing rapid aneuploidy, uh, looking for 13, 18, and 21 because of the association with maternal age as well as uh, structural abnormalities. We know that routine chromosomes take about seven to 10 days. Uh, in the States, primarily it's been done by uh, interface fish, but many other places you're gonna look uh, and th they will utilize MLPA or qPCR. And I think this is, uh, it's been shown to be an effective tool uh, to reduce the emotional burden you know, on the patient. And you can actually argue and or the physician or genetic health counselor or healthcare provider that are dealing uh, with these anxious patients, you know, once they have an abnormal screening result. And it's certainly an opportunity uh, to reduce anxiety by providing an, uh, a window for earlier decision making. So <clears throat> we're going to flip the question and say, what proportion of fetuses with a normal carrier type will have a genomic abnormality? And we started to answer that question with the introduction of microarray. Uh, certainly, the big difference is the resolution, uh, anywhere from 1,000 to 5,000 times the order of diagnostic magnitude. Uh, it really depends on the number of probes that you have, the, the design of your array, and I would say on average it's giving you about 100 times diagnostic 
um, you know, clinical uh, increase. And um, at Columbia, we, we led a multi-center trial, hopefully most of you know about it, uh, really showing the concordance of microarray compared to carrier type. And then the big surprise, at least for us, was the fact that for those that were referred for um, AMA or positive screen, about one in 60 or 1.7% 1 of those have a clinically significant copy number change. And then when we focus right on those with ultrasound abnormalities, it's about one in 17, so about 6%. And if we break down the contribution of, of the genomic technologies that we typically use, so we can see carrier typing, again, um, this is fetal anomalies in the second trimester, we'll pick up about 17%. If we start adding microarray and over and above the 17%, you're gonna get an additional about 6%. And we started, along with a couple of other groups, uh, to look at sequencing. So we said, okay, over and above that, what are we getting? And we actually just published now uh, in the Lancet, uh, you know, our big non-selected study, meaning we didn't pick and choose, we just had certain criteria and took every single case. And this is actually about 13.7%, 13 I rounded it up to 14%. And so that still leaves a big chunk of the pie, uh, you know, and us questioning, well, what is causing the fetal anomalies that we see in the second trimester once we have normal karyotype, fetal sequencing, uh, and, and CMA? So one of the things, and this is gonna be a, a big focus of what I'm gonna speak about or end off with, is that we see about 20 to 30% of our results having what we call a plausible mutation. And this really means that we see a mutation in a, a gene that is not tolerated, it's highly conserved, we don't see it in normal populations, and all the predictive modeling tells us that it's, it's gonna be patho pathogenic, but we just lack um, case studies or we lack uh, you know, evidence to actually support the fact that this has been seen in patient cohorts. And slowly but surely this number is creeping down as, we, as the evidence starts to come in. And so if we add those on, and, you, and, and I'm kind of being optimistic to say that it eventually we'll have the evidence to support those plausible mutations, that's going to bring that pie down to about 35.3% um, that are still unknown in terms of the cause. And so we started to ask the question, well, if we use exon level array, will we be able to pick up anything in addition? And so the idea is that by sequencing, um, you would potentially miss very small exon level you know, gains and losses. Um, so if you had a, a CNV in a critical region of a gene, with a dominant effect, that's one way you could have a, an effect. And the second is, uh, if you saw a mutation by exome sequencing, uh, but you did not see an, in a recessive disorder and you didn't see a second hit on the other allele, perhaps you have a CNV that wouldn't be picked up. So I'm gonna just show you, we I have a few cases that we've done, these are pediatric, just to show you the, the the power of the exon array, and I'll just illustrate that with two cases. Um, the first was a two-year-old with mild anemia, uh, marked microcytosis of unclear etiology, and basically the heme workup suggested hemoglobin CC, um, you know, based on HPLC uh, and the other indicators. Uh, there was also mic marked uh, microcytosis, uh, supported, con you know, concomitant uh, thalassemia deletion, and initial testing by an outside lab, confirmed that there was a deletion of the alpha thal gene, but also showed that the, um, the child was homozygous for CC. And they did have a caveat that a large deletion could invalidate their findings. Mom was normal hemoglobin A, and dad was a carrier of uh, C. He did, was shown to carry the uh, alpha thal deletion. And so we thought in terms of the hemoglobin um, C, maybe there's UPD. So we ran a SNP array. Um, the first thing, actually, sorry, this is the exon array, I'm jumping right to it, but really nice that you can see at the small level just confirming the alpha thal deletion, um, and you, you know, 1.69 KB and 2.3 KB. And for those of you that are used to looking at array data, we typically don't look at this type of level in terms of, you know, 
really being very small. So turned my attention to the beta globin gene locus, where I thought maybe there was going to be UPD, and here you can see the trio. There is no UPD, but what you can see is a very, very small deletion, and this is using the Cytoscan HD. So there was about a 60 KB deletion in the beta globin gene cluster, um, and there you can see it, uh, you know, the, all the genes, but what you should appreciate is the absence of HBB, the hemoglobin B gene. So, you know, we couldn't confirm uh, homozygosity or, you know, the HBCC. Um, and if you look at the HB, you know, hemoglobin uh, B gene, it's about 1.6 KB, and there was zero probe coverage uh, over that small region. So we, we hypothesized that it's almost certain that in this case, the deletion extends into that gene, uh, but there wasn't, given the absence of probe coverage, this was a great candidate for the exon array. So the exon array has 176 markers, and here you can see uh, clearly the deletion, um, very well covered and confirming our you know, suspicion. We had also confirmed that using qPCR, uh, targeting specifically the HPB gene. And very nicely what you can see, the, the exon array covers uh, you know, uh, all the exons, and here you can see that 60 KB deletion, now including the HPB gene. The second case is a 14-year-old boy uh, with an onset of uh, uh, Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy, that was the differential. And uh, if you look at the EMD gene, it's uh, very, very small, 2.29 KB. Um, using the cytoscan, you can see that there are only two probes covering the actual gene. There are 13 probes proximal to the MD gene and then about 11 distal. Um, and you contrast that to the exon array that has about 150 probes covering the MD region. So really, you know, again, for those of us looking at this every day, having that vague probe coverage uh, and that small size of a gene, I would never call that uh, without any type of uh, you know, extra evidence. So here you can see both the cytoscan coverage. Again, very, uh, you know, I, I would never call that, as I said. And then here with 150 genes clearly showing a deletion, it's a very confident call and very easy to make that diagnosis. So th the lessons learned, and for any of you that attend the AFI users meeting, when you have a phenotype and you're driven by clinicians, and this, is, uh, this has been for everything. This has been for karyotyping. This has been for regular CMA. When we have good clinical geneticists, you know, targeting, having a, a very good differential and getting us to focus in a certain region, it becomes, you know, quite easy. You can target specific genes. Um, and we said, well, what would this utility be with fetuses with ultrasound anomalies? And this is really a hard challenge because, <laughs> you know, the phenotype is often not evident. You're not going to see any cognitive or intellectual disability. Um, so many of the dysmorphic features you can't see. Uh, you could have, you know, uh, metabolic abnormalities that you're not going to see, uh, physiological abnormalities, and certainly, you know, where, what genes do you target? And so uh, we started this, this pilot study that I'm going to talk about, and we try to get some extra guidance. And, and what we did is um, we said, well, I partnered with Mike Talkowski in Boston, his group that does uh, uh, whole genome sequencing, and we said, well, let's look at the concordance of some of our calls done by Exxon Array compared to whole genome sequencing. And we had 10 cases uh, with a total of uh, 762 uh, tier one or level one, which is really the genes that cover the medical exome. Um, and they were pretty much split between gains and losses uh, with a median of about 63 variants per case. And what we saw was about, uh, only about 146 of those were confirmed by whole genome sequencing. So the major caveat is that it assumes whole genome sequencing as truth and the possibility of X and C and Vs as truth, you know, still, yeah, you know, it's still a possibility. And that may seem quite low, but for, again, for any of you that um, do even Cytoscan that has, uh, you know, 2.7 million probes, you know that the moment you start changing your thresholds and saying, show me everything, you're going to see lots of gains and losses, and many of them aren't correct, but if you zoom in and you have a look, there's often just one or two spurious probes that are throwing the algorithm off. So again, it takes a good careful eye for you to understand that and uh, exactly what is true. Um, 
Again, the, the ones that were confirmed, there was really no difference between gains and losses. And so we said, how can we improve the specificity of our Exxon array calls? And we looked at QC metrics. Um, we looked at summarized log twos, mean log twos, weighted log twos, median log twos, number of probes, C and V size. And clearly, log two ratio was a strong predictor of the Exxon call uh, validity. And what we saw was that at least at, at a, a cutoff of 0.25, either up or down, um, most of those calls were confirmed. Um, probe count, again, obvious, obviously, is a strong independent predictor. But when you start saying that you're going to have a lot of probes, you start losing the ability to pick up smaller things. So it's kind of a trade-off sensitivity and specificity. Um, and when we look at 10 probes as a cutoff, here we expect to see about three out of four um, variants being confirmed while picking up about 42% of real variants. And certainly high probe counts or weighted lock two, when you kind of couple all those things, further increases uh, your validity. So um, we did this pilot study. Um, for any of you that read the Lancet paper, essentially uh, we had a fetal West program uh, where all pa patients with structural anomalies, including NTs greater than 3.5, were recruited. There was informed consent, karyotype and CMA uh, through the clinical lab. If that was normal, they had trio whole uh, exome sequencing, um, and that was, again, what we reported. But I was interested, um, and here's the actual article for any of you that are uh, interested, and it actually was back-to-back -back with the Lynn Chetty's data uh, in the UK, which very much showed the same type of uh, results. But we were interested in those that are normal, and so we took a small cohort for this kind of pilot study, and um, we had 45 cases. So not a huge number, this is ongoing. We really, literally, I was struggling to get some data back to, to make it in time, and I think it was giving the thermo people a heart attack. But um, so we have 45 cases that have been done looking at level one exome. Um, and I, I, I really just wanted to see one hit, and that's exactly what we got. And it's really, it was, it was even nicer because this was a case that had been unsold for 11 years. So they had come to the attention of clinical genetics uh, in at Columbia in 2011 for advanced maternal age and a history of children with learning disabilities. At that time, she had uh, multiple children with different fathers uh, that had intellectual disability um, and seizures, as you'll see. Um, and she had one four-year-old son who was healthy, three spontaneous miscarriages in pregnancies that was described you know, with heavy drinking. She also reported a maternal half-sister with a congenital heart defect and a learning disability, as well as a half-brother with a learning disability. No genetic etiology was worked up, and she had had pretty much everything. So in 2017, she came back for prenatal diagnosis. She got recruited into our fetal waste study because the fetus was uh, shown to have bilateral club foot. Uh, she consented to amnio, uh, clinical array and karyotype were normal. Research exome sequencing was negative. A uh, child is now 20 months and so far has no other issues. And so if we look at the cytoscan array, um, and I'm focusing on one particular area. Again, I think most of my colleagues that look at this would, would really have no confidence to call pretty anything over here. You can see uh, a little bit of waviness over here. But if you focus in, you may be astute enough to see that those probes over there, they are distinctly higher. Again, I would never call something like this. But if we focus in on this region, it's uh, the gene KIF1A. Um, which is 107 kilobases in size, and if you look at the probe coverage, there's 43 probes covering KIF-1A. Um, again, the, uh, uh, the log two really not making anything that I would feel confident with. So by the cytoscan, there's 665 probes covering that, so a big, big, big difference. And then when you look at the cytoscan, uh, the, the Exxon data, again, you can see very clearly um, uh, you know, a spike at that region with 665 probes. It met our cutoff thresholds that we had recently established. So, uh, you know, really high confidence of this call. And it turns out to be a 56.7 KB dupe of um, KIF-1A from Exxon 17 through 49. So what is KIF-1A? It's a neuron-specific motor protein that plays an important role in cargo transport along neurites. Uh, patients have mild to severe global developmental delay in intellectual disability. It is a dominant. 
um, but it distinctly has um, highly variable features as well, um, which I've listed over there, and one of the, the key things is also seizures. And so now we actually had a phenotype and a gene um, and an OMIM gene that really matches extremely well um, with this whole family. And um, again, this is like hot off the press, but it, it seems extremely likely that, you know, uh, this is what's going on in this family. So you can ask the question, well, what does exon array analysis add? And just in our small study, if we take those numbers, you're getting one out of 45, which is 2.2%. And that may not sound a lot, but remember, we got very excited at 1.7% for our AMAs. You know, that's, you know, one in 60. And this is over and above everything else. So this is the additive value. And my prediction is that this is probably going to be somewhere between 2 to 4%. Um, again, I can tell you that that number goes significantly higher when we have our good clinical geneticists with a very strong differential and a gene in mind. That hit rate is significantly higher, and that was also presented at the AFI users meeting. So the clinical phenotype of uh, genetic syndromes are almost exclusively derived from descriptions of pediatric and adult cases. And what we are learning is that the phenotype in the prenatal setting is really not well defined at all. So with the introduction of you know, whole exome sequencing and exon CNV analysis, we're beginning to characterize prenatal presentations. We started to see different genes, and, and this, this makes sense because some of the genes that are lethal, we will never see in the postnatal stage. So we really are uncovering like a whole new spectrum of things now. Um, and we're seeing evidence of this in the fetal West. So I can tell you from the fetal West study, uh, these are the, the, the genes that we had called plausible right in the beginning. And what happened was there were new good publications with good clinical evidence and we called those patients back. Um, and you know, we now have a very good genotype phenotype match. And, and in one case, the child grows into the phenotype. So the prenatal phenotype you know, doesn't have to be anything near it. And this was a prenatal phenotype with just a nuchal of 3.5 millimeters. But later on, as the child grew into that whole distinct phenotype, it became obvious. And so what I've done is I've really focused, at least we've started focusing on um, the tier one. Um, and it makes sense to look at the other levels, you know, tier two, which is other ClinVar uh, genes, and tier three, other OMIM genes, and then tier four, pretty much everything else. And I think we're gonna start seeing genes that we wouldn't necessarily see uh, in our pediatric patients. So I'm gonna end there, and I'm gonna thank, I just heart hold thank to, to Christy, who's standing over there, who just did the brunt of this uh, work. Uh, she was just uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I'll thank Jessica Giordano, uh, who's a genetic counselor, again, extraordinaire, uh, who coordinates a lot of these studies, uh, and then Kate Stanley, um, who's the bioinformatics in uh, our IGM. Uh, it's really a whole group of us that work really well together, uh, you know, to, to look at the phenotypes. We, we meet, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's really a great team. And then lastly, I want to thank uh, Mike Chalkowski and uh, Harrison Brand and, and Chelsea Love uh, in, in the Boston group who worked out uh, with us on the whole uh, genome sequencing concordance part. So I'm going to end there, and if there's time, I'll, I'll take questions. Thanks very much.